everybody. Welcome to another episode of Between Two Nerds. I'm J.P. Karliak. I'm Courtney Taylor. And we're so thrilled uh, to have an amazing guest today. He is uh, the voice of Sonic the Hedgehog and so many, 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 many other things. Uh, please welcome Roger Craig Smith. Hello. <laughs> Uh, so if you've never joined us for Between Two Nerds before, this is a show where uh, we're nerds, uh, voiceover nerds specifically, uh, where we get together and we talk about uh, why voting is amazing and uh, also how to be involved in your democracy. So tune in every week. Uh, we'll bring some notable nerds to you every time. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's plenty of fun. So uh, just to get things started. Does that make me a nerd? This is awkward. Spoiler uh, alert, Raj. I thought that I was just the between of between two, but you just said notable nerds. Are, like, are we all nerds now? Is... Uh, yeah. I'm happy good. that you're notable, sweetie. Okay. If you, have, <laughs> if you haven't learned anything during this time, isn't it that if you're in if you're in close proximity to two people that have it, then you probably have it too. Exactly. <laughs> it's, the nerddom spreads. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. I. Uh, I I derailed you to make a stupid joke. No, no, we're we're off to the races now. So, uh, Roger, tell us how are you doing? Where are you? I am well. I am in uh, my home in Boise, Idaho. I'm in my my booth in uh, Boise, Idaho. I moved out of California back in uh, October, so I'm here permanently? Question mark. Um, but uh, but yeah, happily uh, happily uh, working still, which is a a very fortunate position to be in uh considering so many in the industry so yeah i'm uh i'm 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 happy it's nice and cold and chilly and slow and just the way i like things so happy to be up just here just the way you like your no, awesome exactly. chilly and slow <laughs> cold and slow like I'm my i'm mr frost miser i'm yeah <laughs> uh whatever his name was i just know heat miser i i don't know the chilly one uh <laughs> and i don't uh, i'm not nerdy enough to even get the reference what yeah, sorry. What was it? From I, uh, uh, what, what, what was the, uh, not the Santa Claus story. Yeah, of, the, Santa Claus is coming to town. Oh, without Santa look Claus? at the nerds who don't even know their own references now. Okay, Wait, you do Heat Miser. I, I was on a legitimate show of nerds. Apparently, wow. you know what? If we're just, I had we're a totally little, you, were, you know, I saw a hashtag. I figured I'd repeat it. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> It's one of without a Santa Claus. There it was. And it was something without a Santa Claus. Wait. Yeah. And it's the guy with the red hair. Raj, yeah. do you not celebrate Christmas? Are you <laughs> locked up in your booth? <laughs> Snow Miser. Heat Miser and Snow Miser. Okay, now I'm okay. All right. It was one of those creepy, like, you know, 1980s or not, probably more like 70s. No, 1960s stop. or something, like the stop motion where they moved around a little. Mm -hmm. And that would freak out as a little kid when you'd hear that CBS, like, ding, 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 the special, CBS special. That oh. Would that one, that? Pre that one predates me, I think. Oh, dude. Okay. Well, see, now, these are all things. That that scares you, Roger? We say that again. That's what scares you. No, not freak me out. It would just, I would just get like super excited. I mean, it's like that's when you would grab your bowl of cereal. You know what I mean? You come sliding across the wood floor on the socks. You know, jump onto the couch kind of thing because you knew Charlie Brown Christmas. You know. Oh yeah. Yeah, the heat miser, chill miser, cold miser, cold Snow miser, snow miser, Budweiser. <laughs> Budweiser. That came later. Yeah, Buds yeah. McKenzie, all that good stuff. Oh my God! Who also, who just also had a cartoon. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Did yeah. Spuds McKenzie get a cartoon? Spuds McKenzie did have a cartoon. Uh, because I re I remember. It. Or wait, am I? I thought it, I thought he did. Or maybe I'm thinking of Rude Dog and the Dweebs. Probably that more than Spuds McKenzie, the beer dog. I'd yeah, be nothing like indoctrinating kids at a young age. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had plenty of friends that had like a stuffed Spuds McKenzie. Yeah, for sure. You know. Yeah, that's that's the funny part. Like a lot of people did, and you're like, no, no, this isn't. I don't think this is a good idea. Like because we grew up, you know, at the time at the time of like Joe Camel and you know. Oh yeah. All the harmful mascots. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hang on, I got to light up here. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't affect me one bit. This broadcast is brought to you by Paul Mall Smooth. Mm. <laughs> Doctors recommend. Kids don't smoke. No, don't. Don't. Uh, 
Don't do it. Look how we do. Uh, speaking oh. of telling our audience what to do, uh, <laughs> so one of the things that we like to do on Nerds Vote is come at you with an action item, and um, the one that we want to throw at you this week, uh, we've been, been we're spending this year talking about. Uh, how to be involved in your democracy, because um, it's not a major election year, but there are elections happening every month in states uh, across America. So There's always elections, kids. Always elections. Uh, but if you want to, uh, if you did vote in the last big election and you want to hold those people accountable, whether your person won or not, um, we're encouraging you to do so. So one thing that uh, is on the docket these days is the filibuster. Now, if you don't know what that is, is filibuster is something that's used in Congress, both the Senate and the House. Uh, if you are the minority party, it's a way that you can sort of stop uh, the proceedings of legislation from happening if the bill that's going through is not one that you want to pass. And there's discussions right now about whether the filibuster should get that or whether it's useful. Now, I bring it up because it's not a super hot button issue that gets everybody like, yeah, it's just the filibuster. Uh, but I would encourage you to look it up, find out more about it, and uh, have a take a position on it. Do you like it? Do you not like it? And maybe even if you were listening to Courtney on our last show, contact your representative on your phone because you programmed them in your phone, right? And uh, let them know, like, I love the filibuster. Keep that thing. Or I hate the filibuster. Get rid of that. You know, whatever. Uh, make practice this your, the electoral practice, college, your guys. Practice round. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. For more yeah. important things. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's our action item for the day. Take a stand on the filibuster one way or the other and uh, let somebody know about it. Ooh, and then you can also hit us up on social media at Nerds Vote on Twitter and Instagram and let us know what your thoughts are on it. Yeah. This is turning into a little civics lessons, guys. Uh, guys, you just saw the germination in the verdant yeah. brain. Verdant mm -hmm. brain. What have you guys, I mean, what have you, I mean, most people... So I'll play, uh, not play, I will be the ignoramus here. Like to me, the filibuster essentially is just if you were to sit there and say, Roger, uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, um, whatever, lawn maintenance. And I just decided that for the next three days, I was going to tell you, well, essentially. And we didn't disconnect from this Zoom good, call. Good, good. Yeah. Avoid having to worry about invasive species, and and then of course from there the invasive species, and just to go on and on and on till the you know if if I was trying to convince you of something or just essentially to me, I look at it like my initial reaction to it is it has a negative sort of uh, aspect to it because to me it just seems like a like a stunt where we're we're just going to intentionally take as much time and drag this out in an effort to shut it down as opposed to I don't know. That's essentially what it is. And the only way to stop it is a cloture vote, which requires two thirds of the body, whether it's the House or the Senate, to basically shut you down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if that don't happen, then on you go. Um, and they yeah. go for days, right? I mean, they go for days of just one speaker after another. Is this, am I incorrect? Uh, well, the, the longest one, I believe, was it was tw well the longest from one person continuously was uh, a little over 24 hours but uh and that was strom thurman wow love him yeah uh, not recently a... though yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no 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 bathroom that was like 80s or something right that was what i think that was like in the 80s or 90s right i mean he yeah was... that was a while ago but yeah. i don't I, I don't know if anybody's beat him yet uh, his record let's hope not uh, um there yeah. was a woman in texas uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, I mean in the national, uh, right. in Congress. But, uh, yeah, I think she, I think the uh, the woman in Texas who wore sneakers, and I remember that. The... And a diaper, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. right? Cause well, yes. You with can't... Strom, I'm almost certain there was a diaper, even regardless of the <laughs> filibuster length. If it was 1957, maybe there wasn't. I'm making... <laughs> Making it was 1857 in my yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was old. 1857, and it was intended to stop the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Yep. Mm. So Love yeah. Yeah. Lovely. So that's that's why that uh, the yeah. There's a there's a lot of uh, uh, cloudy history about yeah. the, about the filibuster. So uh, yeah. So there's a lot of people who don't think it's a good thing. Uh, there are some people that that argue that 
uh, you know, especially in our case, when the White House and the two houses of Congress are all held by the same party, that the filibuster is a, ne- is a necessary check. Mm-hmm. Other people think, no, it just gets in the way of getting anything done. So right. um, I'm not I'm not going to tell the audience which what what I think. I will on Twitter, but <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I leave it. I leave it to everyone to make their own choice on that. Interessante. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so Raj, yes. I mean, speaking of uh, politics, etc., mm. we had you on the show last mm-hmm. year mm. um, before Instagram was doing the archiving. So we're redoing it. So I hope you remember everything that you talked about back then, because we're just sure. going to kind of go over those things. Cool. Um, I'm sure you have it all committed to memory. If not, um, you know, we are a show about the joys of participating in your democracy. How are things changing for you now that you are in, I mean, you just moved. Yeah. And we just had a great big, uh, you know, election. And how are you, are, are you like inspired by the, you know, huge turnout? Did you vote differently this, this past time because you were in Boise or... What was your process? Well, I was a man so without a country. Different, yeah. yeah, I was a, absolutely, I was a man without a country. Uh, because of the move and because of the timing and because of COVID, um, I was unable to actually vote because I missed the, by the time I was considered a resident here, it was too short within the time frame of, of when you can register. Okay, and Bye, Raj. Yeah. what's that? I said, we got to go. Bye, Raj. Click. It's like, and, and I would have had to have gone back down to California and gone down there and, and tried to vote in person down there. And at that point it was like, okay, this is, uh, yeah, this, it was frustrating, uh, to say the least. And I, I remember going in person here near the DMV and trying to get involved and trying to, to ask the people, like, what can I do? And they just said, it's, you know, you're, you're, it literally was this like window that had happened. And of course, I should have taken my civic duty and gotten in a car and driven and rest of my life to go down and, you know, plop it into the, uh, the ballot box. But I, I, I did not. Uh, so <laughs> sorry. Um, but no, it was, it was, it was interesting. But I mean, it was, um, that was sort of frustrating and that was kind of depressing because I had for the longest time I'd applied for absentee voting Mm -hmm. and because of the moving and the change of address and all that kind of stuff, I checked with the registrar down there and it was like, no, you don't, you can't do that anymore because you're now considered out of state. So you can't do that. And yet up here, I wasn't a resident for long enough, meaning 30 days prior to the deadline for registration for me to become eligible to vote up here. So I really didn't get to vote. Um, you know, uh, and again, yes, I could have, I could have, you know, <laughs> driven down during COVID and all that kind of stuff. And I was already, because of the move and all that, was already nervous enough about traveling and coming around. Oh, totally. Sure. Well, all right. I mean, I mean it does, great... it does bring ahead. up a good point, Roger, is, is in your opinion, do you think that uh, we as a country, let alone the individual states and all of their own individual things, do you, do you think we make it too difficult for people to vote? Um. You know, I don't know. I mean, it's because there's on one level I could understand. I don't know. I, it seems odd to me. The, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's so complicated as all these things are, which is why we why, why we have the discussion. The, there's there's a part of me that feels like I don't understand why I could not have found some sort of federal system or some sort of way to say I am an American citizen. I would like to vote in this election. I don't see why these two states get to tell me whether or not I'm going to be able to do this in a federal election. It just seemed like, you know, and I understand that from states issues, that kind of thing. I mean, not to bring up other stuff. It's like when somebody gets to vote on a contract, you know, that that, that affects you and they don't even swim in the circles that you do and they have nothing to do and don't, and yet they can vote on your contract. It's like, that seems a little odd too. Um, and so for me, it was like, yeah, this this felt like a little bit of a there should be an easier fix to this. There should be some way that I could find some office or someone to, to go to and say, how about, OK, I've given up my ability to, to vote on any sort of the the state run elections, that kind of thing. That makes perfectly good sense to me, because, again, I'm no longer considered a Californian and I'm not long enough to be an Idahoan. So, you know, maybe I don't get to vote in that. But please let me vote for the presidential election. It just seems like I don't that would have been nice to have found some sort of way to rectify that problem. Um, I don't know. I, 
it, if, it, whether or not we make it too difficult, you know, I mean, it, we keep talking about it. So obviously there are many that feel that it is. And I haven't experienced it firsthand because I've always voted by mail prior to this. And so for me, it was a wonderful convenience. Take the time, sit down, open stuff up, do some research, do that. Um, and so for me, I've never really experienced it as a, as a difficult uh, situation, but I'm also a working voice actor who has all the time in the world. It's like, if I'm not working, I'm not working. You know, I'm not, I don't have a family. I'm not worried about juggling a lot of stuff. I could take four or five hours and go dedicate it to something, you know? So my experience is like very limited and therefore for me to weigh in on, it, it's kind of like, eh. but I mean, the fact that I keep hearing it tells me that for some people it is. And I can totally understand what it's like when you have a job and you're trying to get time off or, you know, it's it, it, to, to just to go vote. Yeah. That's a pain in the butt. And it does seem like th there should be a way that we can make it easier. Um, how that is. And literally my mind is, is reeling right now because I sit there and think, well, man, can you imagine if there was some way that we could just do this online? And I know that not everybody has internet access and I know that it's not, it's not as simple as that, but it's safe, unfortunately. Well, yeah. And, and yet in what we're hearing too, with people that have conspiracy theories over voter machines and all that kind of stuff, I just go, no, that would never work because they'd be saying the same thing about the internet and the security protocols and all that kind of stuff with that. It's like, how do we not know it's being violated? How do we not know it's actually you? How do we not know, you know? So there's a lot that it's complicated. I think it's, I think it's made more frustrating because we have become so accustomed to instant gratification and technology being such a massive influence in our lives right now that I feel like we think other things should just be as quick and easy and simple. And yet it's not. I mean, it's like every time you start really thinking about this, you go, yeah, that's very, very complicated. It's a very complicated thing to pull off. It's amazing that we do every four years or every, you know, every month, like you're saying, there's elections somewhere. It's like, it's amazing that we're still functioning as a democracy in the way that we do, you know, uh, <laughs> on so many levels, <laughs> on so many levels. Yeah. But that, yeah. that, that it, that it still seems to somehow work, even despite people's attempts at trying to do what they can to not make it work. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess long roundabout like meandering answer. I, I would assume that the, the short answer is yeah, it probably is. It probably needs to be a little clearer. I also think we need to stop spending so much money, almost cursed, <laughs> so much money on uh, on elections in general. That's the part that always just makes me sick to my stomach is how much money is thrown at these bloviating windbags. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. and what that could be used for, it drives me crazy. I just think like, why, why, why? I'd love to see debates without audiences. No more, no more, you know, parlor tricks with, uh, waiting for your 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 applause beats and you know like look at me i i i i got the sound bite it's like no let's hear your policy let's hear your thoughts let's actually let's have a meeting of the minds and solve problems instead of you know the circus um well it's definitely you know it, it speaks to both the voting thing i think is what i see different now is that people are calling out the problem and staying with their teeth in the problem. And so I'm hoping to see, you know, changes happening because I think people are starting to, and, and, you know, between two nerds is part of this, trying to keep it like a holistic thing where you're looking to make sure everything's working all the time, not uh, just when something goes wrong or not every four years, you know, so that hopefully we'll be able to tackle these things in a way that we can, instead of sort of waking up every four years and being like, oh, this is broken, and then yeah. kind of letting it go. And then, um, you know, as far as the, uh, I mean, we have this ability to do all these things with technology um, and there's never gonna be any perfect solution, but I think we also need, that's a big conversation that I think came out of this last election as well, that a lot of people had to come to the party with, uh, you know, that they didn't get exactly what they wanted and I think in countries that have multi-party systems where there's a very good chance you're not gonna get what you want, but people still stay involved. Um, that's a whole new concept for uh, a lot of Americans is like, you know, hey, we always like, it's it's what I want or nothing. And, um, and I think it's interesting to have this idea that we're gonna have to learn how to compromise. We're gonna have to stay engaged 
with things politically, we're going to have to figure out how to, you know, when you don't get your first choice, how not to pick up your ball and go home. Because uh, even, you know, Democrats had so many people in the field last election that, you know, a lot of people were not happy with who eventually got the nomination. And, um, you know, what do you do in that case? Do you stick around and fight? Do you, you know, try and, and make change anyway? Or do you just, ah, fine, we'll try again in four years? Because politics doesn't really work like that. I don't understand why too. Like, like, I think it's more of a human condition thing that, that has me the most concerned about all this stuff because I see, I don't know. I, I keep going back to like social media on a lot of this stuff. I, I really, you know, for as, as much as I enjoy sharing things and engaging with, with people on there for the most part, I don't think we're wired for it. I really think it's kind of making a lot of us uh, ill and anxious and all sorts of, I mean, like the data even correlates with, you know, the, the, the sort of introduction of social media and what it's doing to depression rates and kids and things like that. It's, you know, like what used to be an embarrassing thing that might've happened to you at your elementary school or your junior high school, or it now could become a meme, you know, could, could literally go global in seconds. And, um, the fact that we now seem to be so self-absorbed because we're all, we're all living on our little perfect little like I'm a star of this little universe universe that I've created here and like look at the likes and the you know the retweets and therefore I must have said something or done something look I'm I'm affecting and it's we we now have community in I'm going to jam my fingers and my ears to what you know I'm I'm being told and just this is my reality and it's okay. And you, and how dare you come after me to, to, to try to act like there might be anything other than this. And I don't know, that's like you say, like we don't solve problems that way. We don't find a way of compromising and we certainly don't learn anything in that moment. And instead of kind of going, Oh, how funny I thought and felt and reacted to this. And based upon what I'm seeing from a large group of other people, maybe I need to check myself and think a little bit about what I was thinking, or maybe I need to listen to them a little bit more. And even though I might still disagree, I, I, I need to, I need to hear, I need, it's like it, the, the centerism and all that kind of stuff that I think was how maybe the two-party system was, was designed to sort of work was that it was like, okay, you over here, over here, but we got to find a way to try to get to the middle so that we can solve a problem that will hopefully benefit as many people as possible. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I like more perfect in the term, just because it's like, guys, it's always, you know, I mean, the, the absurdity of make America great again. It's like, do you realize that today, regardless is the greatest it's ever been because it is constantly in flux and constantly trying to improve upon itself it's not done. It'll never be done. And yet I think some people feel like it's no, it's just and then it's then we're there. And it's like, what about life has ever worked that way for anybody like the 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 the, the, the dangling carrot of and then I'll be happy. <laughs> it's like, no, you know what I mean? So I don't know. It, it, I, it feels like a human condition thing that maybe this combination of this volatile time in our it, it, globally, it, this pandemic, the the what's happening around the world um and then let alone what's happening in our own country maybe what's happening to ourselves that we're taking a, a deeper look inward and what's important in life and all that because yeah i hope that that politically people start to kind of look at this a little bit more importantly and kind of go yeah maybe it is time to kind of really like why have we been doing this this way for so long maybe there's maybe there's something we should really examine and say like maybe this doesn't work anymore in this day and age and and hopefully keep the momentum up and ironically maybe it's because we've been sitting at home and staring at our little devices for far too long and watching the news and watching that, you know, uh, I watched more TV in March of last year than I probably did the entire year before, just cause it was like, sure. wake up, <laughs> crack a beer, <laughs> like sit down and watch the news going like that phone ain't ringing for the next, you know, as far as I, you know, like I honestly couldn't believe that we were going to work or that things were going to, it was just so, and yet all of a sudden, everything about your life, what have I been doing? What have I been wasting time? It was actually a catalyst for me to, to just get up here. I had, I had owned in, in Idaho since 2011. And the goal was always to, to sort of be retiring up here, to be closer to nature and to, to, to slow down. And, uh, and then this just kind of ushered in and I went, I'd be foolish not to just do this now. And also life's too short, you know? Now it's Idaho where young people go to retire. Sorry, Portland. Yes. 
<laughs> no, I'm not retiring. I have no intent uh, to retire. So it's a, uh, but it is just a, a different, it's a reprioritization of things, if you will. But it's great because having, you know, watching your social media, as I do, I just sit at home and watch your social media. And mine, yours. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it's great to see like that you are, we, you know, we used to, back when the pandemic was new, we used to be like, you know, how is this affecting you? And what are you doing to stay sane? And now I feel like, well, like this is just a little bit of how it is. So, mm -hmm. but I love the fact that you are incorporating your um, love of like nature photography and you're bringing it to people who, I mean, it's, it's lovely that you're kind of giving us something else instead of like, here's me in the studio, here's me working. Not that you were like that before, but, no, I mean, but it was. we'd love to see you uh, annoy Tara Strong. Yes. In a while. We do. But Mr. we also love pictures of fat little birds. And yes. um, and it's great to see. And I, and I like just, I love seeing how you're incorporating new stuff into like what you're doing and and how that's kind of changed. That's just my little teeny screen's worth of what's going on with you. But I see you have a drum kit. Yeah. Well, yes, there's, you know, I'm taking lessons. <clears throat> yes. Uh, from no one we know. From no one you know. <laughs> no awesome human being who shall remain nameless. A very awesome, uh, patient human being. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, he's actually one of my favorite human beings now. Uh, and I'm, I'm just, you know, I'll let you guys you can, you can deal with that. It's just, mm. um, I'm not jealous of the bromance. It's fine. No, no, I'm it's, <laughs> I swear. It's like, you know, uh, no, it, um, so this was always, so this was uh, something that, you know, like as a little kid, as a little boy, like I remember just being drawn to the drums and to percussion and rhythm and all that stuff. And, um, and of course my parents wanted me to play the piano, then the clarinet and then back to the piano and you know, something else. And it was like, ugh. And then finally, uh, I was like my 16th, I think it was like, I was 15 or 16. I can't remember. I might've been 15. And uh, my mom rented a drum kit for like a weekend. And I just, you know, was just hitting stuff. I didn't know what I was doing, but loved it. Ended up saving up and getting a, a used drum kit from somebody and then playing in bands in high school. And it was all self-taught and I was muscling through everything. And then right after high school, I was still playing with a band and, and I ended up God, I went on tour for like a very brief like California tour into Vegas and stuff like that um, with a band. And I worked with a singer for a while. And it was like, I thought that's what I was going to go do. Junior college, I started taking a percussion ensemble class. And what? yeah, and uh, then met with the jazz instructor. And it was one of the worst experiences of my life because it's uh, <laughs> like the guy. There's always one of them out there that's a dream crusher. Go up on Tuesday. Here's the, you know, bring a, pair, bring a pair of sticks and show up on Tuesday. And I was like, all right. And we show up and it's like, it's all the jazz kids, including the jazz drummer. And he just goes, all right, this guy wants to, wants to learn. And he just goes, sit down. And I'm like on a kit that I've never played on and that kind of stuff. And he just, he puts sheet music in front of me. And I'm like, I, and he just goes, all right, here we go. And it was, I mean, it was like, literally it was right out of uh, whiplash where it was, you know, it's just, <laughs> It was that kind of a situation. And he just goes, all right. And all of a sudden the band starts and I'm, I'm trying to, I, I couldn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to read sheet music. I was, and it was the most embarrassing thing ever. And I remember thinking well, that guy's a jerk. And that was awful. That was a real quick way to like, you know, I don't know what it, I, to this day, I still think like, what was the point of that? That no one would have been successful and no one would have known what to do. Um, but then I ended up joining a, a percussion ensemble class later on. And my instructor was the, the percussionist for the Pacific Symphony Orchestra. And he pulled me aside one day and said, you've got all of the, the, the uh, sort of, uh, you know, born with talent that, that you would require to, to, to do this, but you've developed so many bad habits that if you were to really want to go back and, and pursue this, um, you'd have to, you know, reverse engineer everything. You'd have to unlearn the way you've taught yourself how to hold sticks, everything. And he said, uh, and to be honest too, <clears throat> at that point, I think it was in my early twenties or whatever. And he said, for you to think that you're going to go be a studio cat or make a career out of this. He's like, there's nine-year-olds that are running circles around you right now in terms of their knowledge and ability. And he said, and it's just, cause that's what they, I mean, it starts young and you sit in a practice and that's all I was doing at the junior college level and all that stuff. So needless to say, so get out, go through, start developing voiceover as a career and all that kind of stuff. But I'd always missed just what it was like to Zen out and, and play the drums. And I bought an acoustic kit, which is there uh, in the bags um, of a DW kit that I'd always wanted and bought the kit, 
but never really played it. And then finally, about two years ago, I was like, all right, you're going to just stop playing the drums. Stop playing, never pick up a pair of sticks and let your body kind of forget because it was already happening. It was like the muscle memory was gone. And so forget everything. And then you're going to take lessons. And of, of all things, I took uh, years ago, I took a, to some skiing lessons. I hadn't skied in like, man, it was like 25 years or something like that. And, uh, and my ski instructor up here in Idaho was a guy in his 70s, uh, which was amazing. And he not only was a former fighter jet uh, pilot, which I was always a big aviation buff as a kid. Uh, so he flew F-16s, was uh, skiing in his 70s. And I was like, I like this dude. And, it, and, I, and then I said, what are you doing in the off season? He goes, oh, I'm a uh, drummer uh, for a big band down in Boise. And I was like, okay, let's talk. You know? and, and I started talking to him and he said, oh man, at any age. And then the Oingo Boingo was a favorite band of mine growing up. And uh, Vatos, uh, Johnny Vatos, uh, the drummer, uh, we've done some charity things together and I've had a chance to pick his brain. And he goes, yeah, man. He's like, I remember when I was 18 and some guy in his fifties would come in to work with my instructor and I was an 18 year old punk and I'd see this old guy walking. And I was like, what's this old guy doing here playing? He goes, and then I heard the dude playing one day and the guy was just ripping it up. Like he could do everything, you know? And he said, yeah, man, if you're thinking about it, go, go get some lessons. So started taking lessons, uh, middle of, uh, last year, I believe it was. And, uh, and it's been awesome because the individual who's teaching me, this wonderful person, uh, kind of had a similar background, um, you know, self-taught as a kid kind of a thing. And that the, this dude has more finesse in his hands and he's taught me all sorts of neat things. And it's super frustrating and so annoying to like sit down and all you want to do is rip and and you're going like, you know, right, left, right, you know, doing all these different things. But it's yeah, it's a it's a wonderful thing to be back into <laughs> drums as a wonderful escape and so i i have this little electric kit that uh that, that that serves the purpose well it's great to just sit down turn it on and kind of zone out for a little bit and do a lot of practicing and that kind of thing so yeah i'm do drumming do you think it's making other parts of your creativity kick in in different ways i think so you know what it is so the photography and sharing all that kind of stuff what happened for me with the reason why i fell in love with photography um after taking a significant break from that for a long time um, and, and even the astrophotography with the telescopes and all that stuff was that so much of what we do day in and day out in the, the business is worry about next month, next week, next year. It's like you're, you're very rarely present. And I remember thinking back to some of the sort of bigger times in my career and just going, I don't even, I don't even remember that day. I was so petrified and nervous and scared and, and, and reeling that it's like that whole year was just, you know, like a wash. And, you know, and I remember thinking, man, that, that being present element, it's hard to, you know, you can look at the photos and go like, yeah, it's, that was a neat day. I think, you know, everyone tells me I had a wonderful time. Um, and, and so being present and calming down is a difficult thing for me. And all of a sudden, uh, cause I've had some people go like, Oh, photography, you're so distracted. You don't realize the beauty that you're in, you know, cause you're just looking at your camera and, and it's the exact opposite for me. Um, sitting there focusing and, and, and thinking about what do I want to achieve with my end result here with this image? So I'm, I'm hoping to compose it a certain way. And before I knew it, I was like, I'm out in the middle of the night and it became a hobby that was easy to do where I didn't have to worry about the phone ringing and somebody saying, could you, um, hey, CBS, could, could you get up? Because they need, in the 15 minutes, you know, would you, uh, uh, and your, all your plans are off and you're hauling butt to get home and you're nervous and you're stressed out. And then, you, you know, it's like all that stuff. All of a sudden here I am quiet in the middle of the night hearing owls or something and you know or, or a twig snap in the, the distance and your all your senses are firing off all these things it was more about just focusing and fixating on one thing and the benefit that that had in my life and drumming of all things with as loud of a of an instrument as it is just zoning out and when you are in when you've warmed up and and you've just gotten into the pocket on like a certain groove or something like there's just nothing better. And, and so for me, I think it does, I don't know that it so much unlocks other cre creativity for me, but it's been a really neat version of there's just something that happens on the brain where all of a sudden I'm just, you know, doing paradiddles and, you know, I'm not re reading sheet music, but, uh, but looking at different drum exercises and all that kind of stuff. And uh, this gentleman helps me with that. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's phenomenal to be able to, to kind of have that to lock into to zone out because it's also just something that I just love. I just, for whatever reason, I will never forget the first time we opened up for Paula Cole 
Remember Paula Cole? Like, where have all the cows? Deeply. I've seen her in concert. There you go. So we opened up. It was the opening band. Yeah, right. At the Coach House down in uh, San Juan Capistrano. It was not San Juan. That's cool. It was cool. It was neat. But so I had this pieced together like a Gretsch, you know, floor. uh, No, I had like a Tom of Rockstar floor Tom, a Gretsch kick. I had old like Pearl jazz kit Toms and stuff that were just pieced meal together. And it was this horribly rewrapped drum kit, but it sounded really good because I would spend so much time toiling over the sound. And I can remember going to the coach house and you get there in the afternoon and you do sound check. And it was the first time I'd ever heard my drum set mic'd up. And, uh, and to this day, I still get goosebumps because I remember sitting there, all you ever hear is just the, the high end, the, the noise of, of you playing. And, uh, and for sound check, it's like, you know, you set up all this, you set up your kit, they mic it. And then the guy goes back and he says, all right, uh, hit the, hit Tom one, you know, ding, ding, ding. And then he adjusts the uh, potentiometer, and all of a sudden you hear ding, doom, boom, boom, and you're like, "Oh no way!" You hear it going through the club. And you're at right, Tom too, doom, doom, boom, boom. You know, bass drum, boof, boof, all this stuff. And then he just goes, "All right, we're good. Uh, just uh, do me a favor, go around the kit, just kind of go off." And it was like, "Okay," <laughs> and just started playing and hearing this mic'd up drum kit resonating in this empty club but with you know subwoofers and all this it was so great and it's like that sound still doesn't get old to me and this gentleman who's remaining nameless knows that i geek out on this is how we 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 were at a super bowl party and we're just i don't remember how something got on the topic of music and i started talking about drums and drumming and then we we were just yeah from there it was you know yeah, it was uh, it, oh dream weaver, yeah. but uh, yeah, it was uh, it's great, and so we we have a ton of fun just geeking out on all this kind of stuff. And he's he's going to forget more about percussion and drumming than I'll ever learn. But it's uh, it's been awesome to to tap back into that and to have that again. Like it's uh, it's cool. Like I, I I get past the geeky element of like yeah, I'm gonna go down the stairs in my into my booth. I'm gonna turn on my electric drum kit and. I'm gonna play the drums and I'm a rock star. <laughs> it's like, but I, I'm happy to be doing it, you know, at this age too, and still kind of getting back into it and learning properly. It's it, it makes all the difference in the world. So I'm I'm very happy to have that back in my life. This is it, amazing. Yeah. It's like watching a kid in a candy store. That's oh yeah. Cool. No, I yeah, it's a it's a well, that's what it's like for me. You know, like it was such I mean, I can literally remember singing in cantate choir at St. John's Lutheran in Orange. Um and we did this Christmas concert for the congregation. And for whatever reason, it was like a more contemporary, I think we were literally singing like a rock version of O Come All Ye Faithful. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Word of God, I'm not, yeah. And there's like a breakdown in the middle of the song where it's just like a drum solo, not a drum solo, but it's just like where the, the every, all the other instruments drop out and the, and the, the drummer's still keeping the beat. And it was always like, as a little boy, I was just like, yeah. It's like, this is the coolest thing ever. We're badass, man. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's like, and that started at like 9, 10, 11 years old, something like that. Just me being fascinated with rhythm and timing. And it's no it's no joke or no no surprise that I would have gone into like stand up and stuff like that. You know, everything was rhythm and timing and 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 hitting the mark and that kind of thing. And And so, yeah, maybe this, I don't know, there's a ton of people that we work with that all have musical backgrounds, theater backgrounds. Yeah. because of the timing that's involved and the and the the music i always say this all the time like of course there's singers that do this because there's there's a there's a music to every line that we say that that if it, if it's wrong it feels like a flat note like you know it's like the the music has to the, the line has to have a certain intonation in a in a certain way or it, or it loses the it loses the magic and uh yeah so this maybe this will influence something but in the meantime i i just don't care i'm happy to to on those days when you just feel like no go down and take 30 minutes and go Tap on the, tap on the skin. Slap on the bass. Tap on the skin. You know. It's so great though because that's that's what that's what you're talking about earlier is that idea that you know we have all like the social media and everything. We're always sort of like multitasking and the beauty of monotasking, which is you know um, JP turned me on to uh, like a monotasking group, and it's been really hard. Yeah. 
And it's basically just putting aside an hour of your day to do one task and do as much of that one task as you can get done. And, you know, we used to be forced to do that because we weren't able to do multiple things. Your phone, your curly phone cord didn't go to your drum kit or, you know, whatever. You, you couldn't have the TV on you know, because if you, and do something else because you'd walk away and you, you know, you couldn't rewind it. Yeah. Now everything is so malleable. We're just like, eh, I can do this and this, and I can do it all at once. So the, it's really, um, it's so beautiful to actually carve out time for yourself to get one thing done, to be present in one thing. Um, and how does that like, you know, fire your neurons differently as an artist? by doing something, a different kind of art, because what you're talking about truly is um, the music you can hear in a, even in a video game or in a commercial, you can hear if the line is clunky or you, they've, you know, the writer put in too few syllables or something and they're yeah. you know trying to make something happen with their script. You're like, no, 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 let me add this in for you because I can hear it. it's supposed to go da 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 back. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so yeah, um, just amazing to hear about the monotasking and about the the creativity coming from other places because I'm sure that it is feeding you in a way that is almost cellular to not yeah. be doing the business part of voice acting, which we are all so, you know, we're all sitting in our booths right now because it's like the most comfortable place and we're used to being here and, uh. you know, we've got a couple screens open and stuff like that. And this is pretty close to monotasking for me and i still have a bunch of things going on so can i ask is the, the is the monotasking group like does the i think it's called i almost was going to call it the portobello method but it's the pomodoro method have you heard of this yeah it's it's very akin to that okay because i i'll be honest like ali ward who hosts a uh, a podcast that i listen to called the ologies which i just we love her yes. we want her on the show it's amazing um, out, out there we want you on the show yes please do this show she's a wonderful human being as far as i know i don't know her personally but i but but talk about some I've, I've watched her when she used to do the mixology thing with uh, yeah. georgia hardstark oh okay. i love that show yeah she's <laughs> like she ha does this thing that i'm just like yeah that's a gift to be able to like she uh, look in voiceover it's always talk like act like you're talking to one person that's the spec we want uh, just yeah, talk. And start the script with Behold. Introducing the all new. Like, no, nobody says that. Like, you know, JP, introducing the all new bottle of water. Like, that's like, you'd be like, what is wrong with you? Don't talk to me that way. Behold my new phone. Exactly. Behold. <laughs> um, no, but she, she makes you instantly feel like this is your friend who's just like talking to you about these really high concept in, in the ologies podcast. It's all about mm -hmm. ologies, biology, psychology, like all these different people who have specialties in different areas of STEM and all this stuff. And they, they, they add an ology at the end of some other research and they become a, you know, something ologist. We'd be, I don't know, I'd be hand fartology or, or something like that. Right. Don't brag about the hand farting, dude. Don't do it. You had to bring up the hand farting. You're gonna, be, you're gonna be working. Oh, that's on. right. That happened last time. Oh, yeah. You know what? The, the hand farting, the elusive hand fart, has been going on since Roger and I did regular show together, and that's yeah. ten years that I haven't been able to hand fart. Yeah. No, but you're. But you know what? If I monotasked on the hand farting, I probably what? could. <laughs> it's the Pomodoro method. Please, yeah. please go into your next cave day court, and when they say, "So, what are you working on today, Ms. Taylor?" What? Here. This is just like regular show. JP, have you got it? See, look at her. She. Oh. This is good. This is good. This is good. Mine must sounds more like I'm giving heart compressions. Yeah. And a, it's a gift. And again, grown man, padded room, drum set, and fun. Yeah. In real life, um, are there, I, I love, you know, that we're bringing up some podcasts for people to look up because I am starting to put little like pop-ups of things so that, you know, this satisfies my, what is the actual definition of juxtaposition click um, mm. that I'm mm -hmm. actually trying to put them in here so that people mm -hmm. can know, you know, a little more about what we're talking about. Um, but is there stuff that you're looking forward to or um, pleased about this year as far as, you um, you know, uh, I know you're into the, ast is it the astral photography? 
It's uh, astro, astro photography. Yeah, I know that some people have said astral photography, and I honestly don't. Know. Taking pictures of like. I don't know what that's. I could make many jokes. <laughs> it's, like... it's, it's when Doctor Strange puts his hand through a portal and takes a picture yeah. and pulls. There you it go. Back astral. Thank you. Astral yeah. photography. I know that you're a big advocate for yeah. uh, things. Um, you know, raising awareness about like light pollution and things like that. So I'm wearing my International Dark Sky Association Under One Sky Awesome Sweatshirt. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm super passionate about that stuff. Cause, cause so, the yeah, these things, these, these uh, like tell us about some of the things that you're interested in as far as like things that do good for the world and our issues that you're interested in and want to raise more awareness. So that's another distraction element for me. Um, so I've tried to focus on the International Dark Sky Association because they've been phenomenal um, in welcoming wel welcoming me into the fold. I'm now a delegate for the organization and I try to do what I can um, to, to promote. And, and when I share stuff online, I try to talk about light pollution. If I'm this time of the year and with the move, I haven't, I've only started breaking out my camera gear to go do some daytime nature stuff. Um, and I haven't really done any, any nighttime photos since probably August of last year. Um, but the season is, is swiftly approaching, um, to when the Milky Way rises for us in the Northern hemisphere at a, at a good time of the night, that kind of thing. So I know I'll be getting back out there and especially being up here in Idaho where I have access to so many awesome dark sky spots. Um, yeah, this has become something that was, it was sort of like, how do I take something that I love? and feel like I'm involved in anything at all. And suddenly this organization that a, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Mike Shaw, um, who's a workshop photographer, accomplished photographer himself, um, he and I met um, when he and uh, Babak Tafreshi, who's a National Geographic photographer, were doing a California Nightscapes workshop um, back in 2016, I think it was. And, um, and I took that class and immediately fell in love with nightscapes, um, which the difference when people ask, is there a difference between a nightscape and an astrophotography? Technically, astrophotography would be if you have nothing in the foreground and you're just looking at celestial objects and it's considered to be more scientific because you're basically capturing nothing but space and anything that's out there. Nightscape, just like a landscape would be, you have some sort of something in the foreground, usually a landscape, but you're doing it at night, so they call it a nightscape. So there's the quick little rundown on that. Um, was so inspired by these two gentlemen and the work that they do and and also just the process. And then I started realizing that when you go out and you take these photographs, you can see this yellow glow that's in the, the on the horizon of a lot of your photographs, depending upon where you are. And they were like, oh yeah, that's, that's the LP, that's the light pollution. And it was like, oh, how funny. It, it, it just casts this very dingy, like brownish yellow hue to all your photographs. And then I realized that, what's that? It's like night smog. It is night smog, and 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 so the, it really and truly is, and and it has. It's easy to think it's a very simple problem, but what it's doing. So this this is where my world sort of collided. Not to use a, a terrible pun with what I'm about to talk about, but started doing bird photography and really kind of became enamored with birds. And for whatever reason, I just find them utterly fascinating. I can sit there and watch them. I don't care what what version of a bird it is. They just are just remarkable and, and crazy little critters. Um, but when you start to learn what light pollution is doing to nature and most especially to birds and especially in, in massive urban environments, um, there's some really, really horrific effects that we have created as a result of wanting to uplight our buildings um, at night for no other reason than to just say, look how tall our building is. You know, it's like there's, it serves no purpose. It does nothing to safety or anything like that. And it can wreak havoc. Um, uh, on uh, on on wildlife and most especially birds because they are so in tune with the moon and stars and things that they are accustomed to seeing that if they think they're flying towards the reflection of something that is stars or the moon they hit windows they hit high rises all the time there's there was horrible data that was coming out of like I think Vancouver or something like that where every night there were hundreds and hundreds of birds that were hitting these high rise high rise buildings and dying. And nobody was aware of this because the gulls were coming in first thing before the light would 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 happen before daylight and the gulls were taking up the the bird carcasses and you know it was like nature doing what it does but it was i know it sounds horrible but uh, but it was sort of like it was people were unaware of the fact that this was as bad as it was and so all of a sudden i started realizing oh light pollution and how it affects birds and that kind of thing and, and got involved with uh with ida um 
and uh, please follow them, uh, International Dark Sky Association, IDA, IDA, uh, IDA Dark Ski, as is always the way I remember it. It's ID, uh, I Dark Sky, IDA Dark Ski. Yes, I Dark, yes, IDA. I'm going to get it wrong. You'll find it. Or maybe we can put it in the something or other. I'm you can tell me. <laughs> wonderful <laughs> telling you that. This is why all you should do is ever, you know, yeah. Um, no, uh, ID, <laughs> ID Darksky is the uh, dot, uh, or no, yeah, dot com. And also it's uh, uh, at ID Darksky on Twitter and Instagram. Um, they are a group that is basically going out and doing everything they can through influencing policy change, influencing education, working with local groups to, to educate people and to do everything we can to mitigate this very, very, very of all the forms of pollution that exist. This is literally the one form of pollution we can do something about like instantaneously and it just goes away. I mean, it's the idea that we're going to do something with plastics and stuff like that. We've really created a mess that's going to take decades and decades and decades to try to repair with many, many forms of pollution. Light pollution, you can take a hood and put it over something that you have on the outside of your house that is shining light on your neighbor's property and is somehow bouncing it straight up and not bouncing it, but just directing the light straight up into the night sky, you cover that and you start stopping light pollution. And, and it makes a massive difference, not only for the wildlife, but also for us. There's something like 85% of the world's population has never seen the uh, Milky Way, doesn't understand what the Milky Way is, doesn't, they don't get to see it. So they don't really know what it is, uh, meaning seeing it with their own eyes where they are. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of sad. And it's something that's just, that's entirely induced by us. And it's entirely on us to try to figure out how we're going to protect and preserve our night skies. Um, because I, I do think that anybody who's ever been to a really good dark sky location, Every, they remember it. And and there's something that I feel like, man, there's something, maybe it's has something to do with why we like wildlife, why we like nature so much. Because when you think about the existence of human beings for how long we've existed and the things that would have influenced us and hardwired us throughout our development, you know, throughout our evolution and the effect that it has when you go out under a, a really good dark sky and you look up and you can just lose yourself in it and, and you start to just ponder everything I feel like that's a hardwired thing that that exists within human beings because of how long we never had light pollution for how long we lived with just being able to see every star in the night sky uh, because there wasn't anything obscuring our ability to 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 have that experience. And now, I mean, I always marvel when I go to New York City and I'm like, uh, Jupiter and that's it. You know, you're like when you're there, you can see like the brightest object out there if you're lucky. Um, and maybe three or four stars when you're in the city, like literally three or four stars and it's just gray haze and all that stuff. But you don't you don't get to see anything. And then you get out to places in Central Valley, California or, or you know, anywhere in Idaho, really outside of uh, major cities. And it's like it's just awe inspiring and it just it kind of floors you. So uh, doing what I can to try to participate as best I can. Um, while being a bit of a ignoramus in a lot of ways and just trying to at least use my social media to not only share my passion and things that I'm interested in, but also kind of remind people like, hey, this is something you can do. This is something you can actually talk to your neighbors about. And if you look at your house, I've had to do the same thing. I've had to look at and go, oh, that's a light that I shouldn't have on the outside of my house. It's, you know, everything from the, the, the work that they're doing with with uh, with governments is is having the greatest impact because street lights are one of the worst things. And now as we're learning too, the blue in LED um, has a really, really bad effect on us as humans. And it's also just really, it's just an, it's an awful light. Uh, it's very glaring and it's it creates my, my complexion at all. What's that? I'm not good on my complexion. at no. all. No. And it's, you know, it's like this little <laughs> camera thing or this, this light thing that I've got in front of me. It's like, I've got to put it as yellow as I can. I have blue painters tape yeah. covered. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, no. I know. It's like, it's all. Uh, oh, yeah, here. Let me, let me see if I can. Uh... Oh, no. This, <laughs> this is the blue one. It's horrible. Yeah. No, it look, makes it look very green. The blue one, I'm going to make it even extra bright. And it's like, see this? Oh, that's that's oh. lovely. Hey. Hey. So... No, see, this is, uh, what are we doing? What, what, why did we do that? JP, what? I don't know. Yeah. 
I was trying so, to bring an interactive component into this. <laughs> the, the color temperature of city lights and and street lights and all that stuff. They're working with these governments to, to to take the color temperature to a certain level and saying this is this is much healthier for human beings. It's much less uh, stressful and it has less of an impact on on wildlife. And just literally, it's just something as simple as putting hoods over these things. And we we take it for granted. Like think about the next time you're driving down a city street. And look at how often there are just lights that are hitting you. And very often it's a lot of like street lights and things like that. But there's also a lot of, there's a lot of things that we do in the name of advertising. There's a lot of things that we do that just, we just throw light into the sky. And we haven't thought about the fact that it's like, yeah, we're, we're losing our night sky and the connection that people can have over a good dark sky. And there are ways to not compromise safety. There's crazy studies that have shown that, you know, crime actually drops in darker areas because the criminals can't see <laughs> they can't <laughs> they can't see you to rob you and so the idea is that well you're less safe when it's dark it's like no not necessarily it's like it happens in areas where there's plenty of lighting because they look for their targets and if you know so there's 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 very interesting aspects to this that 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 seem counterintuitive and yet the more i've worked with this organization and learned more uh the more passionate I, I become about it. So I'm, I'm looking forward. They're doing another, I think they're, it's going to be another virtual thing this year. Um, they did it. Let me uh, very quickly get my, my data properly. Uh, mm -hmm. well, I, part out. I know this is so good. Discover the night international dark sky week. That's what it's international <laughs> dark sky week. 2021 is April 5th through the 12th. And if you follow the international dark sky association, they put together like just an incredible amount of speakers and really interesting people from all sorts of different backgrounds to talk about the effects of light pollution uh, and why our connection to the stars is so important um, and why it's in every single culture that has ever existed, why it plays a role. Uh, and, and for us to lose it, we're gonna, there might be serious long-term effects that we can't even fathom right now. Um, and, and we need to kind of keep putting effort into it because again, technology is exploding um, people are moving farther and farther out into, into different areas. But we, while we love the energy efficiency of, of LEDs, if they're the wrong color temperature, that kind of thing, they can create more problems than, than they're solving. So there's a lot of really fascinating things. And of course, the, the International Dark Sky Week uh, with IDA behind it all is uh, something I'm looking forward to. So yeah, I don't really contribute much other than like retweeting, you know, as much as I can and trying to, to help people. And when I share a photo, trying to talk about light pollution, that kind of thing. Uh, but the work that they do, the the, the people that are there uh, are phenomenal. And we do these uh, monthly meetings and it's incredible to see the membership just exploding um, on the delegate program, especially and worldwide. I think we finally got, I think a few different countries in Africa. Now we have delegates over there as well. Um, so it's, it's just like, it's, it's getting, it's becoming quite international and, uh, and, and it's, it's having a massive impact, which is really cool. So that's that's probably my most inspirational exciting thing i'm looking forward to this year was that the question that was no it was uh how do you like your pizza yeah, exactly uh, what do you fine. have for breakfast <laughs> let me tell you something i'm filibuster happy pineapple <laughs> <laughs> raj um thank you so much for coming on and and doing this i i we went down rabbit holes that i didn't know know existed and um <laughs> is this what you wanted yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you know between two nerds, it's like I don't know if like you know all of a sudden we were drumming and politics and filibustering and hand farts. All the things. Skying. All the things. Okay, all good. The night skying, and that is the kind of nerding that we're here for. Good. 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 Yep. Is that too controversial? That uh, no. The what? Tag no? Shaggy being a <laughs> being a massive uh, <laughs> massively popular singer. No. No. Yeah, okay. Good. No. Good. All right. Good. Not no, go yeah. get involved. It's go fun. vote. Turn off your lights. Put covers over them. Go stare at birds. Yes. Set a timer. Stare at something for an hour instead of your phone. Yeah. Love it. Unless you're Never watching yellow snow. That's another really important thing, right? Never eat yellow snow. Especially if you live in Boise. We don't really mm -hmm. have that problem here, but you know. Yeah. 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 Follow your own advice, babe. Lesson you'll learn only maybe 15, 16 times before you start to figure out what they're talking about. So. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys so much on for that watching. Happy note. Thank you, Roger, for coming on and 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 taking us down some very interesting hand farting. You know, next time you come on, it's yeah. hand fart lessons only. No. 
That's all it is. Hand yeah. parking. We're going to do a special one shot of oh. Roger leads everybody a in. A very special episode of <laughs> hand parting. Uh huh. Between two hands. <laughs> it is the manualist. Horrible. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll have another amazing guest on, and maybe we'll even be out of our booths. We don't know. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye. Bye.